If I didn't have that, that belief that I could get through this and overcome the adversity that I would, had been dealt, then I probably wouldn't be back. Hey, get over here. My name's Jeremy, and this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Let's roll with episode 216 and our guest, Shihan Chris Casabasa. You might remember him from a little movie called Mortal Kombat. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring year, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice each week. As I said, I'm Jeremy Lesniak, the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all the returning fans, and welcome to you new listeners. Do you host events, especially martial arts events? Well, we wrote the book, How Not to Hold a Martial Arts Tournament. In it, we tackle the ins and outs of marketing tournaments, seminars, and any other martial arts events you can think of. We talk about the proper use of social media and other digital forms of marketing, as well as the conventional. Unlike most marketing books, we tie it together with the unique challenges of the martial arts industry. Find it on Amazon or sign up for the entire course full of templates, time-saving forms, and a lot more at KarateTournamentBook.com. Nearly everyone loves movies, and for the majority of our listeners and our guests, martial arts movies are an opportunity to see the pursuit that we're also passionate about brought to the next level. For Shihan Chris Casamasa, though, everything is at that next level. His time in competition, his pursuit of acting, his writing, his teaching, all of them exemplify our motto, never settle. He's worked with the best, and his acting had him side by side with legends, including some past guests of this show. Through it all, he's maintained an open mind and a willingness to continue working as hard as he ever has. Let's welcome him. Shihan Casamasa, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. Happy to be here. Well, I'm happy to have you here. Looking forward to the stuff we're going to get into. Listeners, we had some great conversation beforehand, and, and that always gives me a good idea of how the whole rest of the conversation is going to go. So I'm really looking forward to this. I think we're going to get into some good stuff. But if you would, because it's really the best place to start, we're martial artists. We all like to know about each other's history. How did you get going as a martial artist? Uh, I grew up in it. My father, Lou Casamassa, is the one that founded our system and style of martial arts, which is called Red Dragon Karate. So I grew up, you know, knowing nothing else. Uh, I started when I was formally training when I was four years old, although my dad tells me I was uh, running around the, the dojo a lot sooner than that. But uh, that's that's kind of how I got my start. And, uh, you know, my dad got his start when he was in the military he was a U.S. Marine a military police officer, and they sent him over to Japan, where he fell in love with the martial arts. And uh, the he's got my dad's got black belts in ten different styles of martial arts, so it's pretty amazing. But his very first one that he got was in judo, and uh, he was, I believe, one of the first five Americans ever to be promoted to black belt in Japan at the Kodokan, uh, and he got promoted by Risei Kano, who is the son of the founder of judo. And uh, so he fell in love with the arts there and, and just studied and, and kept doing his training. And, you know, we're doing that. You hear the terms mixed martial arts, you know, very common nowadays. But uh, my dad was actually mixing martial arts before anybody even thought of it and, uh, and thought of doing it. And is one of the early pioneers of American karate, which essentially became mixed martial arts. So growing up with a parent who was an instructor and a, and a style head, did you have a choice about training or was it just kind of expected? Yeah. Here's the cool thing about my dad. He, he gave me, he gave me a choice and it taught me a lot of things. So he, when I first, the reason I said, I remember it for, because that's when he said, listen, if you're going to start, then you've got to do this until you make black belt. So that was my, you know, he didn't care if I started or not. I mean, I guess he assumed I would do it eventually, but I wanted to start younger than, most people at the time, you know, in the in the late and mid 1960s, there weren't a whole lot of kids training in martial arts. You know, it's mostly adults. Where today, that that whole dynamic has changed. It's mostly kids, and there's not so many adults. But uh, the choice he gave me was: you can start, but you can't stop till you make it to black belt. And once you make it to black belt, then you can do what you want. Um, but it took me a long time to get there. You know, it took me six years. So I started when I was four. I didn't make my black belt until I was 10 years old. I actually even failed my very first black belt test, which is a story I love to tell my students because, you know, it's hard. And to earn a black belt, especially at a young age, is, is a difficult thing. And, 
you know, there's those people who, who believe that kids shouldn't be black belts and some that believe, you know, that they should. And that's probably another debate for another time. But, uh, you know, when I made it the first time I tried it, I, like I said, I failed and I, I assumed I was going to pass because my dad was my instructor, but uh, little did I know, uh, that wasn't going to be the case. So, uh, you know, at that time, you know, I failed my test. I had to wait an entire year to retest again. You know, black belt testing, you know, back in, in that day was once a year. And if you made it great and if you didn't, well, then there's always next year. So I first tried at nine years old, failed. And, uh, and then I got it when I was, uh, when I was 10 years old and I fell in love with it, you know, at that point. And my, my dad was really my hero growing up and it gave me a great opportunity to be around him, to see and experience all the things that he was doing. And, uh, I lost Jeremy. you there. For, yeah. I lost you there for a second. You had said that your father was your hero growing up. Yes. Yeah, he sure was. And, uh, you know, he was in his day, one of the most amazing martial arts guys I'd ever seen. And, uh, you know, being my dad, of course, I'm, I'm a little prejudiced on that, but you know, I, like I said, I had fallen in love with the martial arts and, and when I made my black belt, I just really decided I was never going to quit and kept doing it. What was it like growing up, you know, knowing it, it's hard to compare, of course, you know, knowing nothing else than being a martial artist, but certainly being around it, and, and being around your father and the people coming in and out of the school, you could probably have some sense of what it was like away, outside of martial arts. Were you ever tempted to stray? To not train? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I took, uh, I took one year off when I was 17, 17 years old, because at that time I'd been training for 13 years, and I was – second or third degree black belt at that time. So I had the powerful combination of being a black belt and being a teenager. So not only did I think I knew it all, I thought I could do it all <laughs> and that I didn't need martial arts to do anymore. Um, so if there's any teenagers listening uh, right now, listen, you guys think you know everything, but, and I don't know if we can curse, but you're going to hear it because my dad was a Marine. Uh, you don't know. It. And the older I got, the more I realized how much I didn't know. So it was probably one of my, my biggest regrets taking that one year off. Although it was good because it showed me the value of, of what it was that I was learning and doing and how important it was to accomplish the things I wanted to accomplish in my life. So it was a good eye opener in hindsight uh, so that I, I made sure I never wanted to do that again. Was there a particular event or incident that pulled you back into training? Yeah. You know what? Here's the funny thing. My friends that I had made in, in training kept training and they all got their next degree and passed me up. And pretty much for my whole life, I was used to being the number one guy in line. And, uh, I came back and I was like seven, six or seven in line. And that really struck a blow to me. And I was like, this sucks. I don't ever want to be in this position again. And the year I took off, it actually took me three years to catch up to get back to where I was and, uh, and to get back to my, my number one spot in line. So really it was a pride thing for me. I, you know, I'd like to be the number one guy in line that would do the salutation to start the class and, and do all that. Uh, but that wasn't the case when I, when I took the year off and I, and I came back and I really, I wanted to explore. And again, I was, I was 17, so I didn't know what I really wanted to do. And, uh, you know, when I realized after a year, I, I really just missed it. And I wanted to get back into it and, and, uh, but just my love for the art. What did you miss? Like, can you articulate that for, for us a bit? I can, I missed active. Well, first of all, actively training and staying active is beyond anything that, that you can just for your, for the mind's sake, like to take a year off of, you know, I had been training three, four five days a week for what, 13, 14 years straight. And then to take a year off and do nothing, like the first couple months, I was like, this is a, this is pretty cool. But then after that, you know, martial arts, what I found is it's one of those things that if you don't use it, you lose it no matter what your age is. Like you'll always remember the experience and you'll remember, you know, mentally the things that you could do, but then you try and do them and your body gets out of shape pretty quick. 
and uh, you're not necessarily able to do those. Now, when you're young, you're, you know, you're 17, 18, or even in your 20s, you get that bounce back where you can get back in shape really quick. But when you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, that timeline starts to get longer and longer. So I also found that when I was training actively, my mind was sharper. And the ideas that I had and got to do things, uh, you know, whether it was college or, or high school work, just was it allowed me to focus better than without the training. You know, when you're physically active, your brain gets stimulated. And so it really helps. It really helps, which is why, you know, to this day, I still encourage people of all ages to stay physically active and to keep trying to engage their bodies in a way that will stimulate their mind. For sure. I think we've got a pretty good idea of, of who you are and, you know, listeners, I'm sure you're, you're getting a sense of to the, the depth to which martial arts has taken our guest today. I was, we talk a lot about stories on this show and I was wondering if you might tell us your favorite martial arts story. My favorite martial arts story. Yeah. I'm right. sure you got wow. a ton of them. Well, I do actually have a ton of them. But I think I just told you my favorite martial arts story, and that's growing up with my dad training me uh, through there. But I've got some TV and movie-related uh, favorite stories yeah. that I could share yeah, with you. One of them was, yeah, I was in uh, the TV show Walker, Texas Ranger with Chuck Norris. Uh, and I actually got to fight him uh, or fight with him on screen in his in his TV show, which is was really kind of cool because, you know, he was a one of one of my icons growing up him in, the, in Bruce Lee. So to be able to actually do a, a fight scene with him was was pretty cool. Do you remember the, the title of that episode or the number or something so we can find it and maybe put it in the show notes? I think it's called. Uh, Showdown at El Diablo or or. Something like that. Okay. I'll, I'll look yeah, it was just a short little fight team. It was actually cool because, you know, Chuck Norris knows my dad. And, uh, you know, my dad knows so many people just from being in the, in the arts for so long and being one of the early pioneers. But, uh, but him and Chuck Norris go, go way back. Uh, and, you know, Ed Parker was a good friend of my dad's before he passed. And just so many legends. So to be able to do a, to do a fight when I was going to actually do the fight scene with, uh, with his double, but, uh, it was cool. Cause he was there that day and he's like, Oh, Hey, I know your dad. So he's like, Hey, I know your dad. So I can't wait to beat you up on screen. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like getting beat up on screen by Chuck Norris? Oh, it was awesome, man. It was great. I mean, you hear all the, all the, all the Chuck Norris isms and things like that. The, the legend that is Chuck Norris. So, uh, to get beat up by him was actually an honor. For sure. Let it out. Was it was that the only time you got to work with him on on that show? Was that, or did they they bring you back, or or did he did he beat you so brutally that that yeah. it, just, <laughs> it wouldn't have worked in in the story arc? Yeah, in that one I was just a bad guy day player on that one, so it was a that was a one and done. But hey, it was still a still a great experience for sure. Outside of martial arts, does time and life leave you any any space for for other passions? Yeah, well, my two two of my favorite hobbies are uh, snowboarding, snowboarding, and mountain biking. So, uh, and now I'm into now that I'm I'm getting up there in age. Uh, golf also has become a good hobby of mine. And uh, and so I tell everybody I'm a, I'm a black belt in the martial arts, but I'm a white belt in golf. And uh, I think I've been parked there for a number of years. It's a it's a pretty challenging game, that's for sure. It is, yeah. In fact, there there probably is a lot of correlation between the way a lot of us view martial arts and the way people view golf you know it seems like the the more you know the more you realize you don't know yeah mantra seems to hold Mm mm-hmm yeah that's true what is it about snowboarding and mountain biking that that are in common that maybe relates to martial arts balance (laughs) absolute balance that's for sure um snowboarding i just i fell in love with a lot god probably 20 25 years ago now um and I'd skied, you know, I, like you, I actually was born on the East coast. I was born in, in Pennsylvania. And, uh, so I'd skied pretty much my whole life. And then one day I saw this snowboarding thing and it looked so fun. And, uh, and I wanted to try it. So I 
got a snowboard and uh, it just started to fall literally on my rear end every two feet. I couldn't stand for the life of me. And I was thinking, well, I've got great balance. Why, why can't I do this? And it was a, just a little trick that uh, I finally asked somebody, hey, how, why, am I, why do I keep falling? And in the martial arts, you know, in a, in a, in a base stance, they teach you bend your knees and, and kind of push your knees out and your hips in a little bit. If you do that while you're standing on a snowboard, it literally makes you fall. So I had to retrain myself from a lifetime of experience of this is the way you get your balance to this is not the way you get your balance on a snowboard. So it was a great challenge. And to actually learn, uh, I took my I took a bungee cord and, and bungee corded my knees together because the closer in your knees are, the easier it is to get up and stay up on the board. And 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 then you, it feels like you're surfing on the snow which is pretty awesome. But I had to break a lifetime habit of pushing my knees out and sitting my butt down to maintain balance in, versus the way to actually do it on the snowboard. And I had to do that for the first two or three times and then I finally created that new habit and uh, it just kind of fell in love with the balance and things like that, the uphill, downhill. A mountain biking is just, it's. I like, I mean, golf isn't really action, but it's a good mindset game, that's for sure. But uh, anything that's that's an adrenaline rush. I'm an, I'm an adrenaline junkie, I would say. Okay, fair enough. One of the questions that I personally love to ask it is not a, a positive one. It's, it's about, you know, some of the rougher parts of life. One of the things I've always found is that martial artists have this ability to persevere in a way that the general population just doesn't. If you're willing, I'd love for you to tell us about a time in your life where things were difficult and how you were able to reflect on your martial arts training, whether that be the mental aspects or the physical aspects, to get past it. Uh, well, a, let's see. A recent one, probably from about seven or eight years ago, was I tore my Achilles tendon. And... Two things really help because now for anybody that's ever done that or injured a knee, you know, when you're in a an activity or, or a profession that requires you literally to be on your feet uh, and to move, now you've taken that ability away. I was really, I got depressed and uh, because my whole livelihood was just about, I mean, it wasn't, my my livelihood wasn't taken away from me, but my ability to do what I do and I've been, I've been very blessed physically as far as, you know, I've gone through an entire lifetime of martial arts with nothing more than bumps and bruises and your typical sprains and black eyes and bloody noses. But for an injury like that, it was very devastating. And um, I, I did it to myself. I did it. I was I overtrained and I went to go compete. Um, and uh, it was hurt and I knew it was hurt, but I didn't know to the extent of it. And while I was competing in the middle of my routine, it snapped and, uh, and put me down. And once, as soon as it, it did, I, I knew, I knew what happened. It felt like someone hit me with a baseball bat in the back of my leg. I actually looked back and I thought like there was someone, someone hit me with a bow staff during my performance. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, when I saw well, there's no one there. Then I was like, okay, so this thing, this thing is snapped, but you know, mentally it was a, it was a tough, tough blow because I couldn't walk, you know, and I had to have crutches and, and do the whole thing. So what pulled me through that, there were two things that pulled me through it. When I tore mine, David Beckham, the pro uh, soccer player, I think it was him, also tore his Achilles like either a couple days before or a week after I had done it. And for something like this, I had interviewed a bunch of different surgeons and got referrals because, you know, again, being my livelihood, I didn't want to have just anybody operate on my, uh, Achilles. I wanted it back and I wanted it better than it was before. And if that was possible, you know, it was going to do my due diligence and research and find a way to, uh, make sure I had the best surgeon. And I, I found a great, uh, great, great surgeon that came highly recommended from, a, from a bunch of different people. And so he did a great job on the, on the Achilles. And then the rehab place that I went to, uh, was also known for helping, you know, gymnasts and Olympic athletes get back on their feet after, uh, after injury. So the combination of those two things really helped me out. But in the interim, in the meantime, one of my inspirations was David Beckham. Cause I told my, both the surgeon and the physical therapist, I said, look, if you guys are as good as people say you are, 
you'll have me back doing what I do faster than David Beckham gets back to do what he does. So it's kind of like a, I challenged myself and I challenged my surgeon and my physical therapist so that we all kind of pushed to get through there. And then really just the mental focus of, of being in the martial arts is, is what saved me. Because like I said, I was, I was really bummed out and I was really upset. And, uh, if I hadn't been training in the martial arts, if I didn't have that, that belief that I could get through this and overcome the adversity that I would, had been dealt, then I probably wouldn't be back. But now, you know, I'm back and that Achilles on my left side is actually stronger and feels better than, than the one on my right side. And, and I'm back doing, I can do literally more things now than, than when I was in my thirties. So I think that's a, that's a good lesson of, of perseverance and, and sticking through. I think that's what we're trying to get to, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. How long did it take you? How long from, from injury to being back? Let's say 98%. Uh, well, they told me it was going to be a year. And that was the other thing. When you get news like that, like you can't do martial arts for a year. You know, again, uh, in, I was like, F that there's no way I'm taking a year. Again, if you go back to my story about when I took a year off before when I wanted to, now I was almost being forced to take a year off. I go, we're cutting that in half. Six months. I said, if you guys are good, we'll do it in three. Just 90 days out of the boot, out of because the, they cast you and they put a boot on you to make sure that you're doing. And my surgeon, it, uh, bless his heart, like he knew that I, that I wasn't going to listen to his direction. So after he did the surgery, rather than just wrapping me up, he put a cast on my foot and ankle so that I couldn't move it because he's like, I did a great job on you and you aren't going to mess it up. And they, they inverted my, not inverted, but, uh, they lifted my foot up and cast it so that I couldn't press down like as if you would press down on a gas pedal. Um, and and they, they, he kept it that way for six weeks on purpose because when I woke up from the surgery, I'm like, you didn't say that we, you were going to put a cast on it. And he's like, yeah, but I heard you talking and I, I knew that you'd be trying to do stuff that you shouldn't be doing. So we're going to make sure that our surgery sticks, which was I'm, I'm glad he did because he was right. I would have done it. But uh, I was back within three months, I was back on the floor without my cast, without the boot. Um, I wasn't jumping and kicking at that time. And I would say probably by the end of my sixth month, uh, I was, I was back to that 98%, uh, in there. So we really cut the, the return time in half. That's impressive. And you chalk that up to your, your martial arts dedication. Yeah. My, my mindset, my focus, you know, once I got over the initial shock and depression of, of just being, you know, literally disabled and not being able to do it, um, it was the, the mindset and the, and the focus and discipline of being in the martial arts that, that helped me through that. And again, I had a great team. I had a great support team. My family was very supportive. My students uh, and the other instructors at the studio were very supportive. If I didn't have that kind of support, I couldn't have done it. The physical therapy, uh, the team over there, they were phenomenal. And, uh, you know, my surgeon is, you know, he's an artist and, uh, he really did a great job on repairing that Achilles. Obviously your, your father as your first instructor and your father has been a huge part of your life, a huge part of your martial arts. And I mean, maybe you wouldn't have even found martial arts without him, but if we take him out of the mix and I ask you, who's been the most influential second to him, who would that be? Um, two people actually, one, uh, was a guy, uh, who became a, a close friend and a coach and mentor of mine. His name is Steve Fisher, uh, out here in, in California. And, uh, he was probably one of the biggest influences in my life besides my dad. And then one of my biggest inspirations besides my dad was probably the same person that inspired, you know, most of the rest of us that are in martial arts today. And that's Bruce Lee, you know, watching him do the stuff that he did on in movies and on TV was a, was a big inspiration. You know, he literally created a whole generation of people that got excited about the martial arts. So, uh, I think besides my dad, those two people probably had the biggest influence on me. You're right about Bruce Lee. Obviously, you know, he, he is still the most influential martial, excuse me, martial artist alive. No, sorry, not alive on the planet, despite not being alive. Yeah. What was it about, you know, as, as someone who, who's a big fan, what was it about Bruce Lee for you that made him so influential? Well, I think I'd never seen anybody do what he did before. And just his energy, the way he performed on screen 
was really something that get it well, for me anyway, it just got you, you like, you couldn't wait for it to be over so that you could get up and try that. Yeah. Yeah. Was seeing him on screen part of what inspired you to pursue that? Yeah, I think so. I think it was, you know, uh, uh, watching him do that. And, uh, like I said, it was really just influential as far as the excitement factor. I would watch him and just get excited to get up and do martial arts. And I was already doing martial arts. So, I mean, imagine how excited people that weren't doing martial arts and, and just how popular he made it for, like I said, an entire generation of people that had only heard about it, but have never done it. And here I was doing it and studying it and watching this guy and then be like, wow, man, I want to do that. I want to try and do that. Which again, I think came from martial arts, right? You watch somebody do things like that on screen. And if you don't have the right mindset, you're thinking, it's not, it's not, I want to try that. Your, your mindset is, I can't believe he's doing that. I could never do that. Right. That's a, the wrong mindset to have. But being in the martial arts, I was like, I can't wait to try that. I can't wait to, to get up and, and see if I can do that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, watching him do that is really what inspired me years later to, to want to do films and, and movies and TV shows. Now we just heard a lot about Bruce Lee. So I'm going to, just in case he would be the answer to this next question, let's, let's cross him off the list. If you could train with anybody anywhere in the world, alive or dead, who would that be? If I could train with anyone? Yeah. Anybody you have. Who would it be? Is that anybody that I haven't? Hmm. I would actually, well, going, going back to my roots and using the influence that I have, I'd like the ability to train. It would have been cool, I think, to train with the founder of judo, Dr. Jigoro Kano. It's such such an amazing martial artist, and and fortunately, you know, we've got a a, a bit of history on him. You know, I mean, certainly mm-hmm. more than others. And anyone that hasn't read up on the founding of judo, we talk about a bit on the show, and and actually, a lot of the foundation of judo creeps into some of our Thursday episodes. You know, we've we've done one on the history of rank on belts, and of course, mm-hmm. that tracks back into judo. So his his fingers made it into just about all of our martial arts in some way. Yeah, very influential. Let's talk about competition. Has that ever been a part of what you've done? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I competed professionally on tour for just about 10 years on the North American Sport Karate Association Pro Tour, Mm -hmm. uh, which is commonly known as NASCA. I was a four-time number one open forms champion four years in a row. And kind of like Seinfeld, I decided – I was going to go out on top and uh, retired from competition actively in uh, 1993, 92, somewhere around there. But um, yeah, so that was a big, uh, a big part of my life for a number of years. I wanted to take and, and started competing locally like most people. And I got the, the competition bug again, being that adrenaline junkie that I am. Uh, you know, I started competing locally and really I'm, I'm really competitive. You know, it, you know, you go to a tournament and you win, you go to the next tournament and you don't win. Uh, that's uh, if you're, if you're hyper competitive like me, then you're like, uh, this is not acceptable. So you go back and you practice and you work harder. And, uh, so I got, I got bit by the competition bug and, uh, started from the local Southern California, uh, competition circuit out to the NASCA circuit, you know, and that's, that's the big fish in the little pond, uh, thing that happens to a lot of people when they compete. But fortunately for me, I did, again, uh, whether I'm just stubborn or, or persistent, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I was winning all the tournaments on the local here in Southern California. I went out to NASCA and, uh, got killed my first uh, few attempts out there. And, uh, and so I was like, this is also not acceptable and, uh, started practicing more and more. And I found, I found a good mentor. I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Stuart Kwan. No, not familiar with him. Uh, a lot of people that compete are familiar with him in the in the mid late '80s. Him, Stuart Kwan, George Chung, Cynthia Rothrock uh, were the gods of the tournament circuit at that time. And uh, Stuart was a local guy in Southern California, so I wanted to get somebody that was better than me to to coach me and train me. And, and uh, he helped me a lot and really inspired me to get better as far as competition goes. And 
and that was it. So I was out there and got on the pro tour and, and uh, started having little victories here and there and wasn't consistent my first four years on tour. And then the fifth year, things started to really pop for me and uh, ended up in the number one status. And of course, with my mindset, I was like, okay, I'm number one. I'd like to stay there. Uh, and so I competed and stayed there for four years in a row. Impressive. Yeah. And, this, and it was time to move on, you know, and then, it, you know, I was, I was again, opportunity and, and preparation, uh, equal luck, right? Everybody says, Oh, you're so lucky you did this and you're so lucky you did that. But really I was just prepared and the opportunity was there. It was in the right place at the right time. And, uh, the battle of Atlanta, I think it was the 1992 battle of Atlanta that I won the, the weapons grand championship in. That night in the crowd, there were producers uh, from a TV show that they were putting together, which ended up being a, a show called WMAC Masters. And they had asked me and a few other guys and uh, and girls who had won that night if we wanted to be in a TV show. And we had been, you know, at that time, a lot of people had approached us to do this project or that project, and none of it really came to any fruition. But, you know, we, I said, yeah, that would be that would be great. I'd like to do that. And uh you know, we didn't hear from six months go by nothing. And we you know we're still competing and, and being out on tour. And then one day we get a phone call that says, Hey, we want you to come to uh, universal studios in Orlando. We're going to shoot a pilot for this show. And we shot the pilot it was me, Hakeem Alston, uh, Mike Bernardo, uh, Herb Perez, and uh, a bunch of other people at who were, were the top competitors. I'm in the TV show WMAC Masters, and it was on Fox for, I think, three years. And uh, so it was a great experience, TVs and, and movie shows, and just kind of kept going from there. Hmm. The listeners, we, we have listeners of, of varying ages. So, you know, I know your projects. I mean, there, there, there are some things that you've done that I'm quite the fan of. And thank you. We, we, well, Thank you. <laughs> I mean, certainly some elements of my childhood that you brought to life and got me up off the couch, uh, you know, saying, I want to try that. Of course, not all the things that you did were uh, physically possible. <laughs> so, um, but I'm guessing we have some listeners that may not be connecting your name to some of your some of your movies. So I'm wondering uh, if you might just kind of indulge me and, and you know, because I can't go out there and slap them all and say, Here's what you need to go watch. You know, we don't right. have prerequisites for the for for listening to episodes. But talk about some of your projects and and not just to list them out, but what it was like working on them. Because we have an opportunity in talking to you that that we get to know what it's like kind of behind the scenes. And maybe you can share some of that stuff with us. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that I inspired you because that really is one of the things that I try and do nowadays is if I can inspire a new generation to, you know, watch me do what I do and they can go, Hey, that's exciting. I want to try that. Or I want to do that. Uh, that's great. And I, I, what you just said to me, I've heard countless times when I do seminars or when I go to, to comic conventions and, and events where people say, you know, you're the reason I started martial arts. I mean, that is such an honor and, and such a cool, cool thing to hear somebody say, that uh, it really just fills my heart with just love for to continue to do what I do. But to answer your question, I think the, the biggest project that I've done where people recognize me the most, which is crazy because I was wearing a mask, uh, <laughs> is Mortal Kombat, where I played the character Scorpion uh, in the Mortal Kombat films and also in the TV show, in the web series. Like I'm one of the few uh, characters that's been in, in almost each incarnation of the uh, – of the franchise that's been going on, which also has been an honor and a privilege and, and, and the people that have put those projects together, I'm forever grateful and thankful for. Um, so yeah, if you haven't already Googled it and Google my name, uh, Chris Casamassa is Scorpion, uh, from Mortal Kombat. The other cool thing, another cool project I did was, uh, Batman where I got to actually wear the bat suit and I doubled for George Clooney in the movie Batman and Robin. So whenever you see him, uh, kicking or punching in that movie, uh, that's not him. That's me. And uh, so that was really cool, too, just to be able to wear that suit. I mean, so much history and stuff goes on with that. You put that suit on. And the first thing that you do when you have the suit on is you find a mirror and you look in it and you say, I'm Batman. 
So it's really that was I mean that was a, that was a blast and that was the first giant uh, budget film like it was a hundred million dollar film that we worked on in that project so to work on a, on a film of that scope and that magnitude uh, was actually pretty cool. But those are probably the two biggest projects where where people will recognize me the most and of course I had masks on in both of them. Right and, and was that giving you a, a complex at all? Say here we we want you in this film but we're not going to show your face. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But I mean, I've also done a ton of projects where I've, I've got to show my face. I got to fight Wesley Snipes and Blade and, uh, you know, got to fight vampires against Buffy and martial law with Sam Hung and, and VIP with Pamela Anderson, all where I'm not wearing a mask. So those are, you know, that's all pretty cool, too. But yeah, for a little bit there, I was like, all right, if there's a mask character role, I'm pretty much guaranteed that I'm going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, at, at now, you know, I'm guessing some of the listeners who may not have known your name prior to listening are, are probably sitting there saying, whoa, you know, and then we've, we've probably rocked them back on their heels a little bit. What might you tell people? What don't, for those of us, which is almost all of us, that have never been in a movie, that have never done a fight scene in a movie, that have never had to translate martial arts to martial arts on screen. What is the biggest misconception? What don't we know? Uh, two things. One, I'm going to, I'll give everybody, anybody that's listening that wants to pursue film and TV work, I'm going to give you the same advice I was given uh, all the way back in the 1990s, which was great advice. And it, when I heard it, it totally resonated with me because until I heard it, I didn't really understand that concept. But once I heard this, and the, the, the advice was given to me by a, a, a great guy by the name of Pat Johnson, who is in the industry. I mean, this is the guy that was responsible for all the action in the first four Karate Kid movies, yeah. all the first Ninja Turtle movies, uh, of course, Mortal Kombat, Batman and Robin. Like this guy has put together more fight scenes and more box office probably, probably than anybody. And he gave me some great advice when I was first starting out. And he said, Chris, I want you to understand that you are a great martial artist. He goes, but on film, they can take a great actor and make him look like a martial artist, but they can't take a great martial artist and make him look like an actor. So take acting lessons. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty profound. And then if you, if you look back and you research, even going back to, you know, one of my early idols, Bruce Lee, like he took acting lessons. You know, there, there was a whole thing of him where, you know, he had to be able to speak and read and, and show emotion on screen that goes beyond your martial arts training. So that's the, the probably the best advice I ever got. And it was true. You know, it, and one of my one of my favorite movies uh, for martial arts, besides anything Bruce Lee did, was uh, the movie The Matrix. And if you look at that movie, Keanu Reeves, you know, he did such a great job. And you believe that he can actually now he did, you know, take some training and and uh, and do some martial arts. But, you know, whether you love him or hate him, he did a great job of acting that role. So he makes you believe that he's the guy from The Matrix. And I always use that as, as the example uh, of that advice to do where they can take an actor and, and, and they can make him look like a great fighter, a great martial artist. The other thing is in this in the industry of movies and TV shows, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. And if you are ever lucky enough or fortunate enough to get on a on a set, on a movie set or a TV set, my advice is be nice to everyone because you never know where those people are going to end up. Some of the people that I met on on some of my very very first projects ended up becoming really big directors and producers and through the courtesy and discipline that I learned in martial arts, you know, my dad taught me treat everyone with the respect that you want to be treated with. You know, my goal was to be kind and nice and, and, and good to everyone. And people remember that, you know, I would get phone calls years later to work on other projects where they say, you know, we worked with you on this project a number of years ago and we just thought you were so nice. We thought you'd be good for this project. So being kind and being nice to the people that you meet along the way, is also probably the, that's the number one and number two piece of advice I could give anybody that wants to get into the business. Thank you for sharing that. We've heard similar things from some of the other actors that we've had on the show. You know, it's 
yeah, I mean, we spend all of our time training for martial arts, but if you want to be an actor, you're not an actor martial artist. You're a martial arts actor. You got to yep. gotta refine those chops. Mm-hmm. Let's switch out of movies for a second. Books. Are you at all a fan of martial arts books? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't think so. Define martial arts books. You can define it however you want. I mean, th- it, it's an interesting question for me to ask because we we tend to get a lot of polarity. People either are big readers and and they find that they're able to pull in a lot from the books that they read, you know, around martial arts, philosophy, teaching, things like that into what they do as a martial artist. And then we have others who some folks just, just don't read. And in fact, I I'm one, I don't read a lot, but a lot of the, the people that we've have on the show say, you know, I just don't see a good translation between martial arts and capturing it in words. I uh, would tend to, Agree with that. Now, when I say I, I'm not a fan of martial arts books, like you know, uh, how-to books and things like that f- for martial arts, I think because it's an art form and it's a skill, it's hard to learn from a book. So if someone was trying to learn martial arts from a book, I mean, you could, but it's always good to have a mentor and a coach and, and someone live that can see you do it. That being said, I love to read. I constantly read because one of my core philosophies is if you're through learning, you are through. And I never want to stop learning uh, about anything. So I'm constantly reading and trying to expand my knowledge, uh, at, at least now for the next this next chapter of my life, on the business side of what we do. Um, there's a great book that I'm reading now by a guy named Grant Cardone called The 10X Factor, or 10X, uh, which talks about mindset and, and, and working 10 beyond what you think of multitasking, which shows that humans aren't really supposed to be multitasking and you comes from computers and doesn't apply to humans and the human mindset. Uh, so those are two really great books that I recommend for anybody that wants to, to read and expand their, their mind on, on just anything. Some, some really powerful stuff there, I believe. So I believe reading is essential to growth, uh, cause it does stimulate your mind in the same way that exercise helps to stimulate your mind. What are you learning? That answers your question. It absolutely does. Thank you. All right. I told you the questions are vague. Gives you the space. Go go wherever you want to go with it. Because yeah, def- turning you know, left at Albuquerque here, I think. Hey, that's that's fine. That's fine. Just you know, watch the ocean. Um, <laughs> unless you're in in one of those silly cars that can has a motor in the back and you can float. Right. <laughs> What's what are you looking forward to? You know. Goals or are there are there things in the future something coming down the pipe that you're just looking at you're saying I'm super pumped on this. Yes, my my programs and my help uh, that I'm trying to help kids whether they're in martial arts or not in martial arts. Um, I have uh, speaking of books, I have a book coming out in September called Bullyproof Fitness, which is uh, a book for parents. It's a guide for them uh, to help the the battle of, against bullies and bellies and, and make their kid feel like a super ninja. There is a, an epi- epidemic in the United States and really all around the world of childhood obesity. So for the last 10 years, it's been my mission, my path, my purpose to do what I can to help end that epidemic. And um, I've got a, a few programs that are out there that, that have helped you know hundreds and thousands of kids to do it. But my goal is to help a million kids get fit, healthy, strong, and confident through, you know, regular exercise. And of course I'm trying to inspire a new generation of people who aren't doing martial arts to get them involved in the martial arts. And, and, uh, one of my core programs that we have licensed schools around the country is called kick and fit kids, which is a six week program for kids where they train three days a week for 30 minutes a day. They do some martial arts some stretching, some strength training. Uh, they're in, they're out. It's a fast paced, fun class for them to inspire them to want to get fit and healthy. And, uh, you know, we run these transformation challenges for them to, to help them do it. And we've got 72 locations that are using kick and fit kids around the country. And if anyone's near a computer right now, they could go to our website, which is kick shameless plug right here. K I C K the letter N F I T kids.com to find the location nearest them. And if, if school owners are listening and they want to become a licensed location, there's a link there for them to get more information on that, to help us 
win the battle against childhood obesity. Uh, and at the same time, you know, with bullying, because bullying is such a big issue, uh, there was a study by uh, Davis and Nixon back in 2010, I think, that said 92% of bullying happens to kids based on one of two factors, their looks and their weight. So that's a pretty staggering statistic. And if I can help change that in any way, then I'm going to do everything in my power uh, to try and do it. So the book will give parents a guide of, of resources and things they can do and look at to help their kids at home. Uh, Kick and Fit Kids and Bullyproof Fitness will be uh, kind of my two my two main thrusts moving forward uh, until I reach that goal of, of helping a million kids across the country get fit, healthy, and strong. Those are great programs. And of course, if someone isn't near a computer right now, we'll have this stuff all in the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And let's kind of continue that that plug time, that commercial time, we call it. If someone wants to reach you, social media, other websites, you know, let's let's have all of it. Oh, I'm, I'm easy to find. You just uh, put my name into any Google browser and you can find a million ways for me. Uh, I'm on Twitter, of course, at Real MK Scorpion. I wonder why I got that handle. <laughs> um, uh, Twitter, Facebook, you can just type me into Facebook. Uh, there's a bunch of easy places to find me, Chris Casamassa on Facebook. My website uh, is my name, chriscasamassa.com. Red Dragon Karate is, our, is my baby. We've got 12 locations here in Southern California. I oversee operations now for my for my dad, who started our company back in 1965. This is our 52nd year in business, um, so we've been around uh, for a pretty long time. So I'm actually pretty easy to find through social media or on the web. Cool. Well, hopefully people will check out all the things that you've got going on, and if they're anywhere near one of those locations, they'll check you out. You know, maybe give you a shout on social media. And thank you for coming on the show. I, I certainly appreciate it. Well, Jeremy, thanks for having me. It's been uh, it's been pretty cool. I like your interview style. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe I can trouble you for one more thing. Some parting words for, well, I guess me and everybody listening. Parting words of wisdom. That's uh, it's a heavy request there, but I'll, I'll do what I can. I'll give, here's the thing. Never give up. Like it's, that's it. I mean, that's one thing I could tell everybody. Never give up on your dreams, on your goals, on your hopes, on your desires. Stay focused on them and don't just give it your best. Give it 10 times your best so that you can achieve whatever it is. You, I, everything I've ever wanted in my life, every goal that I've ever set has been achieved by me not giving up. You know, I wanted to compete and wanted to be the best competitor in the world, but I didn't start that way. I ended up that way because I didn't give up on it and I sought out the help that I needed to get there and I stayed persistent. Being in movies and TV shows was something I always wanted to do, but I didn't start out at the top. I, my first role wasn't Scorpion. You know, I did six, seven, eight low budget movies where I was a background guy for this and, and an extra for that. And uh, I worked my way to it because I wanted, I didn't want to give up on my goals and hopes and dreams. And if you are prepared and the opportunity presents itself, then you'll have that opportunity. You'll have that chance to do whatever it is that you want to do. Just like now, my goal is to help and empower a million kids worldwide, get strong, get fit, get healthy, and get bullyproof. And I will not give up until I reach or exceed that goal. So persistence and focus are probably the two best traits that you should never lose and never give up on. Mortal Kombat holds a special place in my heart. I actually used the theme song as my music for grand championship competitions for a couple of years. Speaking with someone who is such a hallmark of the franchise, well, it's an honor. But then to find out what a kind and solid person and martial artist he is, what's better than that? Thank you, Shihan Kasamasa, for coming on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find all the show notes from today, some great photos, links, and even a video of my favorite Mortal Kombat Scorpion movie fight scene. Can you guess which one it is? Find Whistlekick on social media, at Whistlekick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Don't forget the book, How Not to Hold a Martial Arts Tournament. It's available on Amazon or get the full course with tons of time-saving templates and tracking documents, stuff that's guaranteed, or honestly, I'll give you your money back, guaranteed to help you make more money at your next event. You can find all that at karatetournamentbook.com. That's it for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.